So firstly, I'd like to say thank you to Lord Foster, the Royal Institute of British Architects, um, Reba President Jane Duncan. And I'd also like to say a special thank you to uh, Vice Dean Sophie Giles and Dean Simon Anderson of the University of Western Australia School of Design, uh, York Bormaster of the Australian Urban Design Research Centre, and Lara Pino of Blank Borderless Architecture for aiding me to pursue my research topic, Weaving the Urban Fabric, Understanding the Significance of Community. This was a study that extended across four continents and six cities, looking at informal settlements and the rich social networks which existed to sustain them. The entire trip has really been an incredible journey, giving me the opportunity to meet with people from a variety of cultures and backgrounds, um, really an experience that I hope to build on in the years to come. So my interest in the relationship that exists between the social development of communities and architecture come directly from my experiences of visiting and staying with family members in the, in the informal settlements of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Visiting the settlements, what I observed was a really strong uh, social engagement. I began to see that uh, despite the very difficult uh, physical conditions, the community maintained a strong social infrastructure. It was through the maintenance of these strong social ties that people were able to live and survive within the communities. In undertaking this journey, I wanted to experience how the informality of the built environment enables such interaction to thrive within the informal settlements, to, to understand how the informal and formal can communicate better in regards to both the built and social development of our cities. So during, during my travels, through the use of questionnaires, um, I investigated the subjective well-being, material and social concerns of individuals I met in the communities. Uh, this provided a really good foundation to begin learning from, from the communities I visited too and collectively allowed me to talk to more than 200 residents in, in the course of the project. So the first destination um, that I visited was Shenzhen. Traveling to Shenzhen, I was really interested in learning from the phenomena of the urban village, China's answer to urban informality. So China's uh, rapid economic growth and the creation of mega cities such as uh, Shenzhen have seen really rapidly expanding met metropolitan limits. Amalgamating areas formerly reserved for rural farming communities and the city. This map shows Shenzhen's growth over uh, a 36 year period from 1979 with a population of 310,000 to 2015 where this population has grown to more than 20 million. This is really an, an unprecedented rate of growth. As you can see, areas formerly reserved for the rural farming communities have now become new urban enclaves within the city. Uh, this next image here. Yeah just at the top, shows the prevalence of these uh, new urban enclaves or urban villages within, within Shenzhen. The governance of these urban villages falls under the rural administrative system, which means they can exist independent of the, the building codes which organize the rest of the city. Booming real estate prices have resulted in an increase of density of these areas as the original landlords look to maximize their profits, turning what was once farming communities into the abundant uh, housing for the movement of people, facilitating this mass migration. So the site I selected for my journey was Gangsha Urban Village. Um, it's located in the commercial heart of Shenzhen. This is where I spent three weeks learning from the community here and people um, and the residents. So arriving in the community, what I was confronted with was this incredibly dense urban environment filled with tightly packed residential towers uh, fed by small pathways. These residential towers are actually known locally as handshake buildings. The name comes from the idea of living so close to your neighbors that you can shake hands without either of you having to leave home. The community here really does exist as an autonomous village within the city. Almost every service you might find in the neighboring district of Futian, Shenzhen's commercial center, also exists in its own right within Gangsha. Everything from banks, marketplaces, to restaurants, and even a private police department. Gangsha's urban environment was the most developed in terms of all the, the, the informal settlements I visited. However, there really remained a strong similarity in the fluidity and use of space, especially the way people inhabited ambiguous areas within the community. To give you a sense of how this uh, unique community structures, structures itself, I wanted to present a few instances of how people engage with space socially. So the first instance or first space was a place called Gangsha, Gangsha Square. This major focal point is a relatively large open space which marks the beginning of the urban village and where, where the city ends. 
This ambiguous space within Gangsha is, is a really hi uh, highly valued meeting place in an area with little public, public space available to the residents. So throughout the day, this ambiguous area transforms. In the morning, um, it's, it's vendors that are here. In the afternoon, it's workers. And, in, and then again in the evening, you have um, families coming back. So what was really interesting to me about this, this instance or this area was how it morphed throughout the day to accommodate the needs of the people. This place existed as a central meeting point. And if you were to visit Gangsha, you would at least pass through this space uh, at least once or twice a day. You can see people eat, eating meals and, and congregating around this area. The second instance within the community that I wanted to present um, was a place called the, the Workers' Point, or I named the Workers' Point. It was very interesting to observe um, how, social, how integrated the social and economic needs of the community were. So here at the Workers' Point, um, laborers can be found at almost all hours of the day. Although there's a really strong economic value for the people to be here, what's equally beneficial is this social network created amongst the workers. This hub is really a micro-community which exists to sustain Gangsha's workforce, a place to meet, to share meals, and even news of work. Similar to Gangsha Square, this area existed as an ambiguous space within the community. The residents create their own program and allow for a flexibility within what would otherwise be a very solid uh, built environment. They actively mold how this environment relates to their social needs as well as economic. So in, in this instance, I felt this was a really important image um, to show how space is used and seen within the community. In this image, the informality of space within Gangsha and its nature as a commodity are both shown. Here a woman is looking at the available rent notifications. Um, these are placed up by the landlords. So these tell people if there's an available bed, uh, apartment, or even room. So the built environment in Gangsha in many instance, instances can seem quite rigid compared to the other settlements. However, it's in how people understand and use space that a flexibility arises. Available space within the community doesn't require long tenancy periods. People can rent a space for a day, a week, a month, or even a year. This flexibility means that the urban environment remains porous, facilitating this constant movement of people into the community and outwards. This facilitates this mass migration from, from, the, from the rural areas to the city. So this moulding of space isn't only li limited to the residents, but also informs the streetscape, particularly in how people utilise areas for leisure. So every morning on my way to Gangsha, I would pass on in this underpass, and it would be constantly being transformed by groups of men. In the hot climate of southern China, this area provides a relief from the heat, but also acts as a, as a social node or meeting place to share food and even um, gambling games, as, as, as the men are doing at the moment. So in, in approaching members of the community, I wanted to take lessons off this active moulding of space that I, that I saw almost happening on every corner in every street of Gangsha. So learning from the, the nearby um, vendors, I decided to set up my own stall. Um, this was a way to meet with uh, people in the community over some food and some drink in a more casual setting. So in, the, in, in Gangsha, what I, what I met was, um, and like the other formal settlements I visited, it was much more transitory in nature. I met people from all over China, from workers, students, retired, and, um, and families. The longer I spent in Gangsha, the more apparent it became that people were grouping based on local dialects and customs. This forms a basis for a community structure relying on social networks. So what really identified Gangsha with, this, with the other settlements of my journey was a shared understanding of how space can change and evolve over time an approach which is really vital in sustaining a community in both a social and economic sense. Uh, the second journey of my trip was uh, Mumbai, India. So traveling to Mumbai, I felt was one of the most insightful journeys of the trip. I again had the opportunity to meet with people for three weeks in an informal settlement. This time, the inform informal settlement I visited was Dharavi. This is a place often called Asia's largest slum. So during my time in Dharavi, I was hosted by Matthias and Chovanove and Rahul Srivastrava of Herbs, who have their studio just located here on the, on the periphery of Dharavi. So it was, it was a really good opportunity to be able to be embedded in the community and learn. Dharavi really does exist in, as its own right as a city within Greater Mumbai, spread over 525 acres, 
It presents a really vibrant mosaic of tens of thousands of small businesses and hundreds of thousands of residents, all relying on the city and each other, um, socially, economically, and culturally. This was a place that I was continually told you can find everything here. And it was really true. You could, you could find um, anything you wanted and also replicas of everything you wanted. Uh, so Dharavi is really built by these micro communities in which individuals arrange, uh, uh, organize living arrangements based on a shared identity. In many cases, this is organized through caste, religion, family ties, and even ethnicity. So what I found really interesting in traveling to these areas was to see that they retain their own distinct cultural and physical identities within the built environment. Uh, a few examples presented this intricacy most effectively, I felt. The first um, being a place called Kolewara. So Kolewara is actually the traditional fishing village on the outskirts of Dharavi. It exists as the oldest community within Dharavi. And as you can see here, um, every day as I pass through here, people would tell me this is the most beautiful area in Dharavi. The residents would say this. So what I found most interesting in going to this area was the configuration of homes. Um, they all organize around a shared common yard. These places are very important areas where people interact and meet. And what this does is it creates a series of focal points within the community, small meeting areas that have strong significance within the community. Everything from making food to celebrating cultural events occurs here. So this blurring of um, private and public space is, re is really a common theme within the informal settlements I visited. However, in this context, what it essentially does or lends itself to is the creation of a multifunctional common space between residents. This increases the frequency between people and the residents and aided in the development of what I felt was a collective consciousness in, in, in the community or creating this idea of community. This is another example of, of the yards. It is really a beautiful place. Uh, the second example was an area called Social Naga, Borelli Compound. Social Naga is a really important example of how communities in Dharavi exist at both a micro and micro scale. So just to give you some background, in 1991, Waka Khan and Bao rose to prominence during the Bombay riots. The post-riot tension was particularly unbearable in the hyper-dense context of Dharavi, a place where the codependency between communities is extremely strong. This codependency was being disrupted by the sectarian violence. So Waka and Bao, Bao's just pictured here in the middle, um, they, they allow for this eventual return to normalities by creating a dialogue. So I had the opportunity to work alongside Herbs and Bao in organizing a street exhibition in Borelli Compound. This exhibition was designed to encourage um, people to engage with the idea of a user-generated growth of the neighborhood. So we held a few activities. The first activity um, was actually a photographic exhibition. This was designed to encourage people to leave their homes and engage with us in the streetscape. Residents were also encouraged to interact with the Blockwood model of their, of their compound or neighborhood. Um, this was done to see what spatial iterations the community felt were important to be considered. People actively rearranged the Blockwood model. Some iterations included expanding the courtyard or increasing the, the, the height between homes. What this did was it really allowed for a discussion between us and the neighbors and the locals in, in, in talking about what interventions people felt were important to be considered and also in talking and seeing how, and how space was seen in the community, how people understood the space that surrounded them. The second activity was with the children of um, Borelli Compound. So we asked the children to take us to their favorite places. They voted and took us on a tour of, of the neighborhood. Um, I felt this was really important because during the activity, what we found was that the children were taking us to areas of social significance, landmarks, places of meeting, such as the local mosque or the small openings that they met with their friends. This thought was further expressed in the mapping exercises we held with the children afterwards. Um, to try and understand these social nodes and, and the areas of significance. What we found was that landmarks were, be, were, were given importance based on the social activity held there. So these exercises really allowed for us to create a dialogue with people that lived in Borelli Compound, to meet with them and, and to be able to go back even. Um, and what it really did was give an insight into the, the cultural activities and cultural practices that had migrated with the people from the, from the province of Uttar Pradesh 
wherever successive generations people had moved from. So my t participation with OBS and, and the people of Borelli Compound allowed me to, um, to work alongside and collaborate with some more established researchers, such as Sheila Patel, uh, the founder of Spark, who invited me to work alongside uh, Jokin Abinith, who's the, the founder of um, the National Slum Dwellers Federation in India, and a, a former Nobel Peace Prize um, candidate. So the third instance was a place called Mah Mahim Station. So I was invited to accompany um, Mahila Milan and the National Slum Dwellers Federation to the settlements which occupy um, places along the Mahim Station. So these are visits that um, National Slum Dwellers Federation and Mahila Milan have been t undertaking for the last 27 years. So I just wanted to show you the built environment. The built environment here is a really strong reflection of both uh, the social and e economic influences on the community. Mahim is actually one of the youngest settlements in Dharavi. Um, being invited to homes and meeting with locals, what I was really surprised was that there was a degree of regularity in both the housing typologies and use of pathways. This could be seen in, a, in, in an independent continuation of uh, language of scale within the community. Buildings consistently occupy these small spaces and are fed by a typology of ladders that feed the homes. As you can see, this dense, this dense urban environment really has its own independent and unique physical identity from the last two areas that I showed you. This is a really interesting example of how the Ravi exists um, and is formed by micro-communities. So throughout the community, what I saw were, were these incisions made by individuals into the, into the urban fabric or into the built environment. An example of this is the small, the small tiles placed in front of doors. These express the householder's religion. So this one is a Hindu one. Um, if you go down the street, you might find a Christian or even a Muslim tile in front of the doors. I felt these, these expressions of identity within the streetscape were, were very powerful. So seeing these people were, um, and, and seeing the people at both a macro and micro scale and the organization that existed in Dharavi really displayed to me the complexity that can exist within an informal settlement. For me, what was most interesting was to be able to see the, the control people had over their built environment and to, and to be able to mold and, and create these incisions within the urban fabric. These both related to identity and social interaction. So the, the third journey, or the, the third leg of the trip, was Rio de Janeiro, um, Hosinho. Traveling to Hosinho was really an unforgettable experience. Um, I again had the opportunity to work alongside uh, organizations such as Studio X Rio, Ali, Alia Metropolitano, Innova Urbis, and UN Habitat. So the focus for my trip uh, on this leg was uh, a place called Hosinho. It's actually Brazil's largest favela located in Rio de Janeiro's south zone. In traveling to all locations, what I found really important was to try and adapt to these constantly changing um, environments that I, that I was finding myself in. So learning from the places I visited, I had to find a skill that I could offer to the communities. In the context of um, Rio de Janeiro and Brazil, this, this skill that I had to offer was English. So while studying social nodes, I found an English school for Vela Phoenix and offered my services teaching nightly from 8 p.m or 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. Uh, this was really beneficial in being able to meet people in a, in a kind of constant, a context which was more casual and create a dialogue with members of the community, especially moving up and down the streets and to, just to be able to know people in the communities that really help, especially in the favela. So the reality of the informal settlements that I visited is that they're not really easy places to live, evidently. But passing through Hosinia's incredibly dense urban environment, what's continuously expressed is this fluidity within the streetscape, from the movement of people making their way up and down the hill to the dense network of passageways. The built environment really exists as a, as a reaction to both the day-to-day -day requirements of both people and topography. So this is Via Apia. It's a, it's a major arterial road which services most of the community and, and, and leads from the, the, the businesses to the incredibly dense housing of individuals. So moving on from the, from the school, I had the opportunity to, to work alongside uh, the construction firm called Innova Urbis, one of the only construction firms working within Hosinia. 
So I was invited to, to go alongside with the construction agency to visit homes within both pacified and unpacified districts. Pacified districts are those controlled by the UPP or the militarized police. Unpacified districts are those controlled by um, visibly armed, armed drug gangs. So the first home we visited um, within Oba Obus was uh, Marta's home. So Marta's home is actually located in a pacified district in the east part of Hosinia. What was really interesting about her home was this intergenerational living facilitated by incremental building. Marta grew up on the ground floor, which was constructed 40 years prior by her father. She now has been living on the, on the second floor for 10 years, and her, and her older brother has moved into the, to the original home. In this small footprint, more than 12 members of Marta's family can sustain living. This, this kind of um, incremental building really allows the home to adjust to the, to the social circumstances of people. So Marta's case isn't isolated within Hosinia. Uh, another home we visited was Gerson's. Gerson's home is located in an unpacified district, so it's a bit more difficult to get here. It took us a couple of days, but we, we managed to get inside. Um, so Gerson has lived in the community all his life. His home is made up over three levels, and the ground floor is the original home he grew up in with his family. As his family has grown, he's, he's had the desire to increase more floors. I think what was most interesting in talking with Gerson was um, in talking about this de degree of consultancy that occurs in, um, in Hosinia, especially in the placement of, of windows or how the building may, may uh, hurt people's view outwards. Because in this place, the, the, the air is quite stale at, at some points within the community, walking through the, the passageways. So people really prize this, this air. So what I found um, in viewing these homes, really important, was to recognize the social circumstances of individuals when considering interventions into their urban fabric, which was theirs. Similar to my experiences in India, I began to see that individuals in the informal settlements retained a degree of autonomy on, on their interpretations of space and how they related to them uh, individually and, and to their identity as well. People have the ability to form decisions on how the built environment relates to their, his or hers, economic and social needs, ultimately molding the context in which social interaction is formed. I felt this was really powerful in, in being able to have the, this kind of ability over, over the built environment. So the fourth destination was Ethiopia, Addis Ababa. This was the location I was most familiar with and existed as the, the cultural reference point for my study. Um, this home on the right, that's actually my grandmother's home while she lived in the community. So in, in creating this study, this was, this was a reference point. So I've, I've created a short film of some of the residents in, in, in Addis Kesma, Zaudi and Khalid. But first I'll just talk about um, its location within Addis Ababa. So this district is located in the northwestern area of Addis Ababa. Um, its area is 7.41 kilometers squared and is home to more than 300,000 residents. Addis Ketama is also home to Africa's largest open air market, a place called locally is Makato. So this makes it a really important hub within Ethiopia and Addis Ababa. So I, in staying here, this is a place that I could really talk about endlessly, but in order to explain it, I wanted to, to show it through Zodi and Khalid. So this is just a small video. Sarah Bacho Bodosh, but I'm not even a joke. He kept doing it. 
ያሳውን ብዙም ስለሚያቅም ደውሉ በሰጥሉ ደውሉ ይጣሩ እና አይስራ በጣም ደን ያሪፍ ነው ብዙ ቼንጅ አርግ ይከታለው ይከፈልኝ ለአንድ ቤት ወደ 1300 ብር ይከፈልኝ አሰርቼ ይሄ ደግሞ በጣም አሪፍ ነው የዲሽ ሜንቴናንስ በጣም አሪፍ ስራ ነው እና ውቀና የሚፈልጋ በቃ ይሄ ነው በቃ ቀኖች አሪፍ ናቸው ስራ እየተከለ ነው እና ምኖሮም ነው ከነ ማዘር ከነ አለም ጋር ለቲም ዘይነባ እና ምን አለች ከነሱ ጋር ነው ሙሉ ዩአር ፎር ፉ ጓደኞች ሲመጡ ከነሱ ጋር ምን እናነለው ጀስት ላይ ለምሳሌ እንደና አብል እንግዳ ምናም ሲመጣ እንግዳ እንቀበላለን ቃብረን ወደ ስራ እና ይዳልን በቃ ያ ነው እና እዚህ አካባቢ ያሉት ሰዎች በጣም ጥሩ ናቸው በችግር ጊዜ የሚደጋገፋሉ አንድ ሰው ሲሞትም በሰርጉም ጊዜ በቃ ለየት ያለ የማህበራዊ ግንኙነት ነው ያለው በቃ ደስ ኮሚኒቲ ነው ያለው ያ ነገር በጣም ደስ ይላል ላይ በጣም ደስ ትላለች እና ጥሩ ነው ጸባያቸውም ጥሩ ነው እና ያው እንደምታዩ በቃ አሁን አንድ ሰው ከተቸገረ መርዳት ነው ሲሞት አብሮ ማገዝ ነው በቃ ጓደኞች በጣም ደስ ይላሉ ያ ጓደኞች በቃ ሰፈር ውስጥ የሚያሉ ሰዎች በጣም ጥሩ ናቸው እና አበቃ ሁሉም ጸባያቸው ደስ ይላል ያው ድብድብም እንዳለ ሁሉ እና ያው በቃ እና ከነሱ ጋር ፈልፎ በቃ እንዝና እንዳለኝኛ ስንዝናና በስፖርት ሙቪ ምናም ነው እንጂ ሶስ ምናም ነው ይበጥል ወደ መስጊድ ይሄዳሉ ሰላት ዩኖ ጁማ ጁማ ማለት ያው በሳምንት አንድ የሚደረግ ሰላት ነው የሙስሊም አይም ሙስሊም ሪሊጂ በቃ ያ ነው በብዛት ጓደኞች ሙስሊም ናቸው ክርስቲያኖችም አሉ ብቻ ሁሉም ለኔ አንድ ናቸው ጸባያቸው ደስ ይላል እንግዲህ ባባለን ስፖርት አብረን እንሰራለን አብረን እንበላለን አብረን እንጠጣለን በቃ ወክ እናረጋለን በቃ ሲደብረን ፉትቦል እና ምን አይደለ እንጫውታለን ፉትቦል ነው ማርቤት 
يتكلم كله تتدر يا يا جارا ودي نقدر ورا بيت تبابا ما برا نور ينور لا برا ينور انا طرو سو نو ابرن يا رجل So again, I have to say thank you to uh, Khalid and Zodi in allowing me to feel the moment and spend time with them. Um, in learning from Adis Ketama, I wanted to inform my understanding of the relationship between the built environment and the social networks of, uh, of, of informal settlements. So I did this first by traveling to the rural province of Oromia, where people had migrated from. And secondly, by visiting the new government housing projects located on the outskirts of Addis Ababa. So in looking at the rural co context of Oromia, um, I was really interested in looking at this culture of home building that existed. This area is filled with communities that are t um, characterized by huts or sarbets. And here the family unit exists as the center point for construction. The built environment here really works to facilitate the social interaction between family homes, organizing around communal areas or meeting points. What I found was that when people from these communities relocate to the informal settlement, what they do is they take this culture of space making with them. When arriving in a place like Addis Kazama, the flexible nature of, of the informal settlement allows an, a, an adaption to a degree. In contrast, this was something I saw happening in the, in the new government housing projects located on the fringes of Addis Ababa. Uh, this rigid organization of the condominiums really inhibits uh, community adaption. The buildings here are fixed, and people struggle to mold their built environment as they do in the context of the village or even in the informal settlement. In a sense, an independence is lost. And in order to compensate, people have been making their own independent incisions within the, the urban fabric or the, the new urban fabric, fabric they find themselves. So this is one of the instances. This is a, a tailoring stall that a man has created himself within the community. He told me he'd been here for um, one and a half years. And the reason why people put these stalls closer to the road is, is to, to make use of the, the, the major area of commerce, which is the pedestrian routes. Again, uh, there's another woman. She does the, the same. The, she, she's occupying the same pedestrian route as well. As you can see, the condominiums are too far back from where the street are. The people are struggling to interact with where people are in the, con in the condominiums. So this was a good example of what happens when people try to create their own interventions within, within the, the fixed urban fabric. This was meant to be a group of shops. And al although this is not ideal within the context of, of living in front of these shops, what this would have done was created a social node within the community and an area for commerce for people. These are what's lacking in these areas. So this really shows what, what these areas don't have. So what I found was um, despite this changing context, People really carried an understanding of space to their new environments and even construction me methods. When we move too far from these uh, fam familiarities, the community suffers. Isolation occurs as community members lose independence in how space may be interpreted. So as a final goodbye to, to the communities of Addis Ababa or Addis Ketama, I just hosted a small street exhibition for, for the locals. So I had continuously people asking me what I was doing in the community, taking photos, and harassing people. So this was just a uh, few images from the street gallery exhibition. People were invited to take home some photos of themselves. So to parallel these experiences, I've been trying to take, take back my studies to the local context of Perth, Australia, looking at social relationships and suburbia. Although this part of my study really remains at an early stage, by comparing answers to the questionnaires that I took to the, to the different communities, I can see that there exists a greater degree of um, social isolation within the built formal context of suburban Australia. So in designing the questionnaire, I looked at uh, existing methods of um, measuring subjective, subjective well-being, such as the OEC Better Life Index, the Hadley Cantrell Ladder. Um, and although my study remains in a, at, a, at a beginning stage, um, what I'm finding is that in terms of social interaction, the suburban context continually has lower averages and responses. So these are just a few of the, um, some of the four questions I asked. In, in total, the, the questionnaire is about 50 questions. But 
This is just the beginning stage. So what I've found really interesting in traveling to all these settlements and, and starting this comparison study is that even without the existence of formal planning and organization in the informal settlements, there really, uh, there's, a, there's a high degree of fluidity that exists in both people's understanding of how space could be used and in the expression of identity. Despite the difficult living conditions, people retain an autonomy on how space is, um, space People retain an understanding of how space may be used in the expression of identity. Sorry, despite the difficult conditions, these environments permitted individuals to make incisions and slowly mold the urban environment around them, facilitating a degree of independence in how architecture relates to individuals and people's social needs. Design existed as communication. Social networks were established through frequent interaction and facilitated by a built environment which remained malleable. This is what I saw. So my study remains at an early stage. However, I'm currently organizing a publication with the Australian Urban Design Research Center and uh, academics and writers from my trip. So I'm really looking forward to continuing my study um, from, this, from this point. So thank you again. It's really been an honor. Thank you. Incredible. Uh, I'm very jealous. Uh, uh, I'd like to open the floor for at least for a few Sorry. minutes if anyone has any questions or wants to talk about it. I mean, just to out myself, I've done a relatively similar trip when I was uh, a bit younger, roughly 30 years ago. And I saw, uh, I saw this, and this is uh, Darabi as well. Yeah. Darabi is one of the places that you have to visit before you die. And it is, it is actually amazing how, how, I mean, I've never seen anything like it in my life as an organism that you can only understand it when you're there and when you meet the people, when you talk to the people, how they all inter interact and how gentle and caring they are with each other, for each other. So, um, I mean, it was actually really nice for me to, to see you do this. It's kind of those weird things in your head. Uh, I mean, you, have, you, you did have an amazing trip without you saying it. I, mean, I know you had one of the best experiences of your life. Do okay. something with it. Definitely. That's the only message I have. But ask, ask some horrible questions. <laughs> Come on, juice it up a bit. Ask him uh, whatever. Yeah. Um, well, thanks very much for the fascinating Oh, thank you. Um, uh, I was fortunate enough in, in uni also to travel. Yeah, we can do this game. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I was fortunate uh, during uh, uni times also to travel to some formal settlements and what I always found very interesting is that some patterns that you um, observe are not so different from what, uh, what we experience in the first world or whatever you want to call it. Mm. Um, some problems that they face, some challenges, some solutions they find. So um, I'm interested in do you, do you think there's any lessons to be learned from these cases which could, in a maybe abstract way, be applied to our situation in, in London, UK, in Europe, wherever? Yeah. Um, definitely. I think in starting the journey, what I was looking at was uh, the two reference points of the Australian sub sub suburbia and the informal settlement of Addis Ketama. Those are the two places I knew. Mm -hmm. So in, in looking at Addis Ketama, people really retain a strong um, they had social networks and they, had a, they knew their neighbors. They had a, a stronger community is what I felt. So f for me, what I felt was in, in the context of the informal settlement, there was a greater understanding of how people could interact in ambiguous areas and, and took control and molded how they built environment related to them and their identity. I think in, in, in a formal context, uh, this kind of is being given away to the developer or to whoever is the designer. But in terms of um, the informal settlement, I think what I felt was that there was a higher degree of uh, independence in how people understood their space, because there, there was less um, restrictions on how, how, what they could do with it, mm. uh, if that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Um, what are the fundamental practical actions that you think the built environment can take to improve lives? 
and livelihoods of these people in slums? That's one question. And another one, a sort of DNA of a bottom-up urbanism. It, do you plan to, to say or to communicate what, what are the issues that these communities treasure? Because the relationship of condominium, you could see that there is a problem. Mm. How do we get the, these replacement settlements right? Uh, yeah. That would be interesting to know. Thank you. So I think the first one, um, well, in looking at, for instance, looking at a place like Ethiopia and Addis Katama, and then looking at Dharavi, what I found really empowered the people in Dharavi was this economy that, that existed almost everywhere. So people had a means, in Dharavi, there's a, there's a lot of millionaires that have come out of, of that place because of this um, economic empowerment. So what I felt, in, in the context of Ethiopia, people were living in the settlements but not finding work. They were moving to the markets to work in the markets. And these markets weren't owned by them, they were, they were owned by wealthier people from the center of the city. So I, I think in, in making the area better for them, I think there has to e exist a, a degree of economic independence and also, to a degree, I think it exists in the land rights. To be able to make money, you have to have some control over the environment that you live in or on. So that's what I felt was really important. And then secondly, about creating better places. I think um, the people that live here are really, they're the experts. They understand um, what issues they have and why people are living in certain ways. I talked to one lady in Dharavi and she told me that um, I went to a house, it was immaculate, it was beautiful. She told me, on the outside, um, we have to make our houses, uh, we have to present them in a certain way to avoid taxes or to avoid um, uh, theft. So there's different um, circumstances that occur. Every place is different. Even Dharavi, it's built by micro-communities. It isn't one neighborhood. So in, in what we were talking about earlier was I felt that the architect's role or the designer's role was in um, translating what people wanted into like a spatial reality. So that's how I felt. Anyone else? I have one. Yeah. Um, thank you for a beautiful talk, and the pictures are absolutely amazing. Um, I did. I was lucky enough to have some traveling experience as well, um, <clears throat> and I think from my experience, one of the outcomes was to actually evaluate the importance of microeconomy. Yeah. Um, what is your understanding of microeconomy in these in informal settlements and how crucial it is? Pardon? The last, last part? How important is microeconomy mm. in informal settlements? I think it's, it's really important. Like in, in Dharavi, again, was a really good example. Um, in Mahila Milan is a, is, a, is a charity that works with women in the informal settlements. So what they do is they, they microfinance women in a family. And then when they build homes, they put the, name of the, they put the woman's name in, in the home. This avoids domestic di disputes, because when, when the woman has power in, in that settlement, or in that context, she's less likely to, to, to receive domestic violence, or be, be, the, be the victim of the domestic violence. So really, like, economic means is, that's, like, that's number one. These pe people need to, um, need a freedom or a degree of be able to progress from their, co their, their situation, I felt, in looking at. So mi microfinancing, microeconomies, is, it's definitely, I think, uh, they need an independence from, from, or be able to progress. And I felt like in uh, the context of Dharavi that existed, in other contexts such as um, Addis Ketama that I saw, there was a restriction over people's ability to grow or to make money or to, to finance themselves. So there was, there, was, there was more severe consequences from that So in, in the context of Ethiopia. Hi, um, thank you very much for the talk. It was really, really uh, interesting. I just have um, a question. You talk about obviously a lot uh, about sense of community yeah. in in very different contexts and types of settlements. Yeah. But I I haven't heard much about the space that affects these communities. So there are different kinds of spaces and different kinds of settlements. Yeah that would affect how these communities come about. Yeah. So what would be your opinion on that, or, or how do you see these different contexts? Um, what what I felt was that the, the, the person, how they interacted at an individual level with their, with their built environment really affected the development of 
networks or social or, or the, the development of a community. So I think at, at the beginning that, that exists with the interaction you have with your neighbor or the person closest to you. And that's what, what, what I saw was affected by the built environment. So in the context of the informal settlement, people had an ability to, if, if they wanted to, rip down a wall or to build something in front of their home or open an opening. So this kind of, um, I guess, independence over where they live and how they lived, uh, that, that's what I felt did this kind of like, um, there was a power that existed there. So if that answers the question? Kind sort of, of. yes, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, uh, in, in Rio, it mm -hmm. happens that the, the slums, the favelas, they are located on the best places of the city with the best views, right? So best views, yeah. There are um, rumors or talks of uh, private development yeah. Yeah, going through. And in the prediction is in 10 years' time, mm. maybe we will see no more favelas there because there will be rich people living there with the best views and the favelas will be just transferred, right? So yeah. um, um, I don't know what to think about it. I wondered if you had any opinion about, uh, I don't know if it's a mixed uh, feelings I have yeah. uh, between I love how they live, the community, and they are there not for their choices, just because yeah. that's the only place they could afford to be. But it happened to be on the best place of the city, right? Yeah. So what do you think of them selling, getting some money, mm. say, to move to another favela somewhere else on a worse place than where they yeah. are? Uh, is there any uh, opinion formed from your trip that uh, perhaps indicate a direction the city might take or uh, what's the moral aspect of it? How do you see that? Um, I, we, we did have some conversations about, because when I went there, it was, um, I just missed the Olympics, but the Paralympics was going on. In some instances, people had been shifted from their favelas and moved you know, onto the, to other um, areas of the city, didn't want as much. But I felt like, um, if these areas can be um, can be monetized and they can create money, I think the people that live there have to stay there. They have to create a kind of a control over, or they have to demand the rights, the land rights for here. And I'm sure people are working towards that there. But I think that's key in all the informal settlements I visited, because over time they're located on the outskirts of the city. But as the city expands, they're, they're in the, the some of the nicest places or the places that have the highest property values. So I think what's really important is for people to demand these land rights and then slowly to be able to have control over what happens mm -hmm. in the places that they lived. China was a really um, uh, interesting experience because <laughs> in the context of the urban village, it used to be a farm. And then as, as, uh, because they have uh, legally um, with, the, with the, the land laws, these places uh, exist as kind of like independent areas within the city. So over time, they, the, the original farmers they came together and they created um, their businesses. So now they monetize these areas and, and give them residence to, to the farmers that come from the provinces to the city. So I, I think it, it really comes, it really, it's really at the point where it, people have to have control on the ground that they live in order to better their situation, I, I felt. So in terms of for people moving or this kind of gentrification you were talking about, um, of course, you know, if people don't, the original inhabitants can't better their lives, then it's not, it's not good. So thanks for your question. Anyone else? Uh, I can't see anyone. Um, I will thank you. That thank you so really, much. Really yeah. Yeah. Thanks Fantastic so much. Trip. Beautiful shots. Fantastic presentation. Well done. Thank you. Keep it up. Thanks. Thank you.